From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 74, recorded on July 18th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to look at Paul's column called This CDC Resignation Should Scare You. Paul, the last 20 episodes we've done should scare people also, but this one in particular, this is about Fiona Havers. Who is Fiona Havers and what did she report to the CDC's ASIP back in April? So Fiona Havers is a 13-year veteran of the CDC. She works in the respiratory diseases branch. So they do surveillance on viruses like SARS-CoV-2, RSV, influenza. So in April of 2025, she presented to the CDC what's been going on the past year regarding COVID infections in children. And what she reported was that that um, children, meaning people less than 18 years of age, comprised about 4% of hospitalizations. Now, she didn't give a specific number, but she had given the, the number of hospitalizations in total, which was between 240,000 and 420,000. She said 4% of those were in children. So if you take the lowest number, the 240,000, then that would be about 10,000 hospitalizations, roughly in children. It's unclear whether they all would be because of COVID as compared to with COVID. So a modest number would be at least 7,000 um, hospitalizations in children. She also said that um, half of the children that were hospitalized were previously healthy, that one in five of the children who were hospitalized were admitted to the intensive care unit, that virtually all were unvaccinated, and 152 children died from COVID in this past year. And so what those those numbers... Uh, tell you what about the importance of vaccination? What those numbers tell you is that it's important to vaccinate young children with a primary series. All children will be susceptible to COVID by the time they're six months of age. COVID is still circulating, and we know that SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID, is still causing children to be hospitalized, sent to the intensive care unit, and die. There is no question that we should at least vaccinate children with a primary series. It's questionable whether all children need a, a yearly series, but certainly they all need a primary series of vaccination. And, and by the way, this was also uh, contrary to the Great Barrington Declaration, which was in 2020, which said, bah, don't don't immunize kids, just let it rip, right? Right. That's exactly right. It, because everybody, to some extent, is susceptible. Everybody is, to some extent, at risk of dying. Of children, obviously, less so than, say, people over 75 years of age. But if you can protect children safely, knowing that they're at risk of being hospitalized or dying, then do it. Now, six weeks after Fiona gave this report, and this is to the old ASIP, right? The the 18 members of experts on vaccines, right? Six weeks later, what did RFK Jr. proclaim? So six weeks later, at the end of May, um, RFK Jr. Uh, stood up on a one-minute video on X with Marty McCarry, the uh, commissioner of the FDA on his right, and Jay Bhattacharya, the head of the National Institute of Health on his left, and said that unequivocally that the uh, Department of Health and Human Services was no longer recommending this vaccine for healthy young children. I couldn't be more pleased to announce that as of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. Um, he also said that the HHS was no longer recommending this vaccine for uh, pregnant women either, thus making us the only country in the world that didn't consider pregnancy a high risk factor for severe COVID. But Fiona Havers, when she saw that statement by um, RFK Jr., that basically he was ignoring her data, um, quit. She quit the CDC. Clear, not clear if he ignored it or just didn't even look at it, right? Right. Hard to Who know. knows? He completely, let's say he completely ignored it. Do we, do you understand why he would ignore it? Well, why he would ignore it is because he doesn't believe that any vaccine is beneficial. I mean, he has said regarding the COVID vaccines, quote, the COVID vaccines are the most dangerous vaccines ever made. This is the deadliest vaccine ever made. He believes he's helping people 
when he's saying that that they shouldn't be vaccinated, when he's making it more difficult for them to get vaccines. Yeah, in fact, he said in that video, we are one step closer to making America healthy again, right? And he believes that. He really does believe that. He believes that that, that, uh, vaccines have merely substituted chronic diseases for uh, infectious diseases and that he is on a war against infectious diseases, as he said recently, that God has put me on this earth to stop chronic diseases. I asked God for 19 years to put me in a position where I could end the chronic disease epidemic and bring health back to our children. You know, as I was sitting at the American Society for Virology meeting this week, you know, a few thousand virologists, experts, I would like to put RFK Jr. in that room and have them tell him why he's wrong. Maybe 1,400 people would convince him. I doubt it. But, but this is the thing. He has no expertise at all. And you have all these experts who are ignored, essentially. Well, and he He's, said that. He said recently, I think I'll give you the most dangerous thing he said. He said, said, we shouldn't rely on experts. That's not democratic. If you want to be democratic, what you should do is just do your own research. We need to stop trusting the experts, right? We were told at the beginning of COVID, don't look at any data yourself. Don't do any investigation yourself. Just trust the experts. And Trusting the experts is not a, uh, a feature of science. It's not a feature of democracy. This is complete nonsense, of course, right? Dangerous. Does he, when he gets on an airplane, is anybody up front flying it or an expert? No, or when you have a gallbladder operation, do you do exactly you just uh, go online and decide how it should be done and then tell your surgeon how you want him to do it? I mean, you wouldn't want Paul Offit to take your gallbladder out, right? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> So he's making America germy again, MAGA, right? <laughs> I know I said it before, but I like it a lot, so I'm going to say it again. Now, um, so, so as you said, Havers subsequently quit. Uh, why did she do that? Well, she sort of said it. I mean, the quote that she gave to the New York Times was, quote, I no longer have confidence that these data will be objectively evaluated with appropriate scientific rigor to make evidence-based vaccine policy decisions, meaning that what she had just been presented had largely been ignored or arguably distorted. She then went on to say, quote, the CDC processes are being corrupted in a way that I have never seen before. If it isn't stopped, and some of this isn't reversed, like immediately, a lot of Americans are going to die from vaccine-preventable diseases. She put herself on the line. I give her credit. She talked to the New York Times. She went on CNN and talked to, to the viewing audience of CDC of, of CNN to make it clear how dangerous she thought all of this was. Unfortunately, I think she needed to go on Fox Entertainment because that's the audience that needs to hear this, right? That's not the kind of person Fox wants to have on their show. Have you ever been on Fox, Paul? I've been on Fox Local New York, but I've never been on National Fox. Although I'm happy to do it, I'm sure I'm not the kind of person they want. On their show. <laughs> All right. So she said two things I want to talk about. She said CDC processes are being corrupted. What, what do you think that means? I think what she means is what she worries about is that they're being ignored. Because normally what would happen is that when you have the kind of data that she had, that then what would happen is that the CDC would reaffirm their commitment mm -hmm. to having a um, vaccine for children as a primary vaccination. The opposite happened. What happened was, after RFK Jr. made that statement, the CDC's childhood immunization schedule changed. So no longer was the vaccine recommended for routine use in, in, in children. Rather, it was shared clinical decision making, which is to say that you should talk to your doctor and decide whether or not um, it, the, the child should be uh, vaccinated. Of interest, I um, had to speak to a group of about 200 or so immunization coordinators um, around this time, and I asked them how many people knew of the Fiona ha Havers data, knew of how many children were getting hospitalized, how many were going to the ICU, how many dying and died, and few did. So that's why it is that we look to the CDC for those kinds of recommendations. I think what's happening now is that the American Academy of Pediatrics is standing up. They're creating their own childhood vaccine immunization schedule, which is going to include COVID vaccines as a routine recommendation for children. So now you're going to have two schedules. And um, I think it's going to be confusing, sadly, for physicians trying to decide what to do. So 
if you leave it up to this shared decision making, do you have confidence that most physicians in the U.S. will recommend vaccination? No, I don't. I mean, right now, what percentage of children less than five years of age are vaccinated? About 5%. So I think already physicians aren't making a strong case to vaccinate young children. I think by making it shared clinical decision making, that will make this even weaker. Because by saying that, by saying shared clinical decision making, what you're saying is it is reasonable not to vaccinate a young child. That's a reasonable decision. Whereas I think it's not a reasonable decision and puts children at unnecessary risk when you could have a vaccine that can safely and effectively prevent severe illness. Now, you you mentioned, what is it, the American Academy of Pediatrics has come up with its own vaccine schedule. But will the, one of the problems with taking vaccines off the schedule is that they're no longer reimbursed by insurance companies, correct? Right. That doesn't worry me as much. You're right. But I think the AAP has now been negotiating with insurance companies to make sure that if their recommendation is in place, that therefore it would be covered. And it is certainly to the uh, advantage of the insurance company. It's much cheaper to pay for the vaccine than to pay for the hospitalization. What worries me is the vaccine for children's program. I mean, that can only be uh, determined by the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, which votes on that program. So usually when a vaccine is recommended, uh, the, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices will vote to have it included on the Vaccine for Children's Program. And if it's not, then for many children, because remember, the Vaccine for Children's Program covers about 55% of children in this country, roughly 35 million children. So if they're not going to be covering it, then I think it's going to make it harder for children to get this vaccine. So this program, the Vaccines for Children, is this a federally funded program? That's right. Yes. Okay. Surprised he hasn't taken it away already. Give him time. So earlier in June, before Fiona Havers uh, resigned, RFK Jr. had fired all of the ACIP members. Who did he replace them with? Did he replace them with other vaccine experts? No. So now there, he actually had replaced them with eight. Now it's seven members. I would say one of them is is legitimate, which is Cody Meisner, who's been on the I think he's been on the ACI but ACIP before, but he certainly has been with me on the the VERPAC committee, the Vaccine Related Biological Products Approval or Advisor Committee to the um, to the FDA, and he's he's legitimate. I mean, he's he's he certainly has an expertise in this field. Um, but other than that, you have um, at least two of those people who are on this committee now who have been paid essentially by uh, uh, personal injury lawyers to be experts in litigation against vaccine makers, against Merck's Gardasil vaccine, against Merck's Mumps vaccine. Um, you have one who is a member of the National Vaccine Information Center, which is an anti-vaccine group who has lobbied states to eliminate school vaccine requirements. Um, the the others, there, there's one who... Um, well, two actually, who signed on to the Great Barrington Declaration. And the others, for the most part, have never published on the area of vaccines. One published a essentially a bogus paper claiming that COVID vaccines cause heart attacks in young uh, athletes. So um, it's um, a ragtag group. It's really a clown show of what was to be the ACIP. And as you wrote before, the ACIP has now lost the... the um was it respect of the medical community or the, the trust of the medical community, right? That's right. I think the right. medical and scientific community. And, and that's why you're now having these other groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Public Health Association, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, American College of Physicians are now sort of getting together to form their own schedule because they don't trust that committee, nor should they. Now, you write, though, in this column that there is one problem with that approach of having multiple societies set up their own uh, vaccine schedule, right? If they're competing. But, but I do think that there is really an attempt, uh, and I've spoken recently to somebody from the American Academy of Pediatrics, to try and coordinate all those other groups so they do have sort of a unified approach. It's mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 25 years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics didn't necessarily have the same recommendations as the ACIP. There's been mm -hmm. an attempt more recently to have a sort of unified schedule so that people aren't confused. So I feel like we're going back to the, the past where we, we have in the past had uh, different schedules. But the, the greater problem, isn't it, that the ACIP depends on CDC data to make its recommendations, right? And that's what worries me the most. And I think that's what worried Fiona, Fiona Havers the most, which is that, you, that if you're going to make a recommendation, it has to be based on data performed or provided by the CDC. And if you can't trust those data, 
um, either because they're being misrepresented or because the CDC just doesn't have the resources anymore to do the kind of surveillance to give you the kind of information you need, then I think we're, uh, we're in trouble. So Havers also has said in her interview that uh, previously reporting uh, the CDC's reporting on diseases was a very transparent process, and now she has said it's being uh, it's being corrupted. But I thought RFK Jr. wanted more transparency. So what is going on here? Right. So RFK Jr. said that he will usher in an age of radical transparency. But you're right. I think Fiona Havers, her quote was, um, the CDC's collection and reporting on the impact of various diseases is, quote, a very transparent, rigorous process. And they have just taken a sledgehammer to it in the last several weeks. So in the end, uh, why is Fiona Havers resignation particularly frightening to you? Because that sends a warning out that she's worried. I mean, she she was a veteran at the CDC because she cared about health in this country. She cared about the health of adults and children in this country. And now she feels she can't be part of a process where that's not true anymore. And I think that should scare people. Normally, when people, uh, either people stay because they um, feel they can do the best they can mm -hmm. by staying where they are. And some people leave and don't say anything. She left and told you exactly why she's leaving, why she's worried, and I think that should worry us all. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point that some people stay because they feel they can control the process, right, in some way, but she feels that she can't because there are people that are just overriding her. Right. Sledgehammer was the word she used. Frightening. Do you think, Paul, it will take many deaths from infectious diseases before this destruction of science and public health can be reversed, or do we need an administration change? I think the only way we get an administration change is if there are, in terms of head of uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, is if there are more and more deaths, or maybe it has to be not just measles and influenza and pertussis, which is true now, but other diseases. And the one, obviously, you and I have talked about is polio. I think if polio in any sense came back, I think that would dramatically change things. No, if, if immunization rates drop, there will be cases because polio virus is circulating in uh, in the United States. And we've been lucky so far that uh, immunization rates are high enough to prevent poliomyelitis, but they don't have to drop much before we see outbreaks. Right. I think people don't realize that, that, that type 2 revertant strain is around. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.